Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Wednesday, May 6th, we are studying Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. Dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That is true for us in holy baptism, St. Paul has told us. And that means that sin is no longer our master. Sin no longer reigns over us. Instead, we are now slaves to God. We are slaves to righteousness. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Clint Poppy. Pastor Poppy serves at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. Pastor Poppy, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Uh, thank you for having me. Great honor as always. As we get started this morning, Pastor Poppy, we're in the middle of Romans chapter 6. Give us some, some context. What has Paul been doing up to this point? What's his argument leading up into the text for today? Well, we have uh, we have one of the most beautiful, systematically laid out arguments, defenses of the Christian faith in uh, chapters 1 and 2 of Romans. We have some of the most uh, hard-hitting, harsh law in all of Scripture. And uh, about halfway through chapter 3, we have some of the most beautiful, beautiful, life-giving, life-changing gospel that is uh, brought to a head in chapters 4 and 5, where we have the great uh, quotes on justification and how God has justified us, declared us righteous, not because of uh, our efforts, our attitudes, or following the law, but by the bloody death and glorious resurrection of Jesus. In Romans chapter 6, he uh, begins to teach us how God has delivered the goods to us. He delivers the deliverance in the waters of holy baptism, where we die with Christ and live with Christ. He delivers Good Friday and Easter to us. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are ours. Uh, very, very familiar verses at the beginning of Romans 6. Uh, we have that in Luther's small catechism. We have that in our uh, worship service at the beginning of uh, a funeral. And then he goes on, and I think some of the verses that we're going to be looking at today are not as familiar, with the exception of verse 23. Many people know and have as a uh, maybe a confirmation verse, verse uh, Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. People, people know that, but there's quite a bit in between, and sometimes it kind of catches Lutherans off guard. God really does expect us to live a holy life. God really does expect us to be Christians, not only in thought, but in word and deed, and uh, some very, very key verses for us today. In that, in that vein, that God does expect us to live a holy life, and I think as we read these verses, we'll also see that God gives us the ability to do that through his gifts. The, the holy life that he expects comes from holy baptism, and as we'll see in today's text, the teaching, the, the doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ, these deliver that holy life to us. Is it is it fair to say, Pastor Poppy, you, you mentioned you know, in chapters 4 and 5, Paul's really expounding upon justification, that, that we are saved by God's grace through faith. For the sake of Christ, God counts us righteous through this faith, not through our works. You've got that, that solid doctrine of, of justification, the article on which the church stands or falls, is he making a move to what we often call theologically to sanctification in chapter 6? What do you think? Yeah, I think sanctification is uh, exactly the move. Some people would talk about the third use of the law. Uh, I, uh, it always bothers me when people talk about the so-called third use of the law. We confess it in the Lutheran Confession, so it's not so-called, it's there. Um, this is the implications for 
being in Christ? What does God expect of us now that he has washed us clean and delivered Jesus to us in the waters of holy baptism? He's given us a new attitude, and now he expects us uh, in these verses, he teaches very, very clearly, to practice what we preach. Um, this sets the stage for Romans 7, a very another very familiar uh, section of Scripture to most Lutherans. Uh, this is a struggle, because the old Adam uh, still lives and dwells and moves inside of us. And so this new life in Christ, pure gift, and the old Adam, this is a daily battle and a daily struggle. And so these, these words of uh, exhortation, um, m- many imperatives here, but this is, this is basically God exhorting us to be Christians, to be who God has made us in Jesus Christ. And that, that form or molding language is uh, right smack dab in the middle of our text. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there are a lot of uh, the imperatives start here in Romans 6. If, if, if memory serves correctly, in yesterday's text, in, in verse 11, where Paul says, you must consider yourselves dead to sin, alive to God, that's the first imperative in the book of Romans. And he starts using a few more imperatives as he, he goes on here. Again, as you said, exhorting us to that Christian life, to the gift that God has given us in justification, that the implications of that are lived out in what we do. And, and I think you're right that, that the verses that we're going to look at, 12 to 22, sometimes are a bit more unfamiliar to us. And and I don't know if it's as Lutherans or if it's Americans or, or just sinners, though the, some of the language <laughs> that Paul— <laughs> Probably so. Some of the some of the language that Paul uses is quite striking, particularly as he starts to talk about slavery. And and I think um, there's going to be plenty of us to plenty for us to talk about there. So let's go ahead and, and read the text. Romans chapter six, verses twelve through twenty three. Paul writes, "Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, to make you obey its passions. Do not present your your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God." as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God, that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now... Present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. There's the text for today, Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. Pastor Poppy, as the, as the text gets started then in verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. This One of the pictures that I see running through this text is the picture of who who's your king, who reigns over you. And Paul says, look, if you're dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, that means sin can't be your king anymore. It can't be your king in your body that you would obey its passions. Take us into to verse 12. Verse 12 is an interesting verse, and it does have that, that king language there. And I think sometimes Lutherans are a little bit nervous with regard to this. Um, we know we've been set free our sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ, and uh, we, we don't want to do anything to fall back into some kind of a works righteousness. And so 
the evangelicals, our Reformed brothers and sisters, many of, many of them talk more about making God the Lord of your life, making Jesus the Lord of your life. Sometimes when uh, we come across those passages in the Gospels where, where Jesus talks about the kingdom of God is here, the kingdom of God is among you, the kingdom of God is in your midst, sometimes we bristle a little bit. We don't want a king, and maybe that's uh, American kind of a thought, too, this uh, rugged individualism. But we, uh, we are taught here by Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that as we think about these things in this context— Who's our boss? Who's our king? Who's our God? First commandment kind of things. Uh, maybe uh, more contemporary language. Who's your daddy? But uh, let not sin be your king. It is God. And when, uh, when the king or the rule is anything other than the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we always, always, always get ourselves in trouble. So first commandment issues at play big time here. What does it mean to have a God? Who is your God? Is it is it the one true God or is it sin? That's the, the primary other God that we're talking about here. What is it when, when Paul says, you know, let let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions? What what is this evidence that sin would be reigning in your mortal body? What does it mean to obey the passions of sin here? Well, I don't think we have to uh, we have to wonder what it means to obey the passions of sin, because it comes natural to every one of us. Um, when when sin germinates in our in our mind, in our heart, it leads to outward actions. When we are when we are focused on things that are outside of what God says is good, right, holy, and God-pleasing. It is, it is easy for us to get sucked in to all kinds of naughtiness, all kinds of problems. And I'm thinking back to uh, Psalm 1, where uh, uh, we, we have that progression of sin, and this, is, this should be common and should be known for all of us how sin works. Uh, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. You see that progression of how sin works. First, we're just kind of walking around with it. Then we stand, and we want to hear, and we want to listen, we want to get involved. And before long, we're plopped down, and we're participating big time. This, this is how sin works. It grabs us, it sucks us in, and it doesn't want to let us go. Mm-hmm. That's that's a, I've, you know I've, I've never really noticed that progression there in Psalm one, but you're you're exactly right that that it is a it's, it's the progression. I, I think of um, uh, James James chapter one is another example of that progression of sin. He I think he uses the image of a someone giving birth and and how it's conceived and it gives birth and it grows into finally into death. So, so sin, I mean, this is, this is what sin would do. And I I think the temptation for all of us is to think that we can engage in it without it having any real effect on, on my life. You know, I, I can, I can do this. I know it's wrong, but it's, it's really not going to harm me all that much. And and within this text, Paul Paul's going to say no. That that's exactly wrong. As soon as you let sin in, you think you have control over sin, but in reality, sin has control over you. Ab- absolutely, and you know we think we can compartmentalize certain things in our lives, and we can keep certain sins or certain pet sins uh, off to the side, and uh, I can still be a Christian, but I can still, um, you know, have my affair, I can still look at porn, I can still uh, gamble away my uh, life saving. you know, we, we can keep these little pet sins, and they won't affect us, they won't harm us, they won't have any long-term good. And what God is teaching us right here in Romans 6, that we need to rid ourselves of that kind of false thinking, because if you are connected to Christ, Christ and his word rules over us, and it is a joyous rule. It is not like the slavery that causes you shame and ultimately 
eternal separation from God. Mm, right, yeah, it, that joyous rule of God, the joyous reign of Christ. You mentioned the, the kingdom of heaven talk that's throughout the Gospels, kingdom of, of heaven, kingdom of God, used in, synonymously in, in Matthew and Mark and Luke particularly, that, that this reign of God in our Lord Jesus Christ is a, and the slavery, as we'll talk about the, later in this text, is not the sort of slavery that usually comes to our minds, particularly now I think as Americans, the, the sort of slavery that we are familiar with. When we're talking about being slaves of God, slaves of righteousness, living under the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is not a, a matter of, of servitude in, in the sense of fear, but servitude as a, as a son, as one who knows the Heavenly Father, loves, you know, I mean, I know the Heavenly Father loves me because I know that he loves his son, Jesus Christ, and his son, Jesus Christ, died for me. And, and that's the sort of reign we're talking about. And it's, it's the total opposite of the reign of sin, which, and again, this is, I mean, this is where Paul's going to make this great contrast as the text moves on between what the reign of sin is and does and what it leads to versus what it means to be a, a slave of God and where that reign leads not as a matter of, of merit or earning anything, but as a matter of, of gift to, to sort of go toward that, the very final verse that we are familiar with, the free gift of God, that that's eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, so as Paul develops that argument then, he, he begins in verse 13, says, don't, don't present your members, your members, so like your, your body parts, I'm assuming is what we're talking about there, Pastor Poppy, don't present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. I think, I think this plays into what we're talking about. When it comes to sin, we, we think that it's only going to maybe affect our, our, our bodies, our physical lives. I, I can engage in this because it's just, it's just my body, but my soul is not affected, as somehow those two things are, are disconnected from each other. And, and Paul, again, won't let us do that here. Don't, don't let your own body don't don't become an instrument of unrighteousness rather present yourself to god be an, a member of present your members to him for righteousness take us into the verses 13 and no 13 13 well the that whole that whole concept of presenting yourself or presenting your bodies you know you uh, through this entire chapter and especially these verses we have a lot of uh, military language uh, Paul's using the example of a Roman soldier and how Roman soldiers work or whatever you uh, you've probably watched enough and the hearers have watched enough TV where someone presents themselves ready for duty whether that be a police officer uh, uh, someone serving in the military, maybe even someone who's been called to service on a jury, and they present themselves ready for service. This is, uh, this is a formal kind of a presentation. And here in, in verse 13, do not present your members to sin as instrument for righteousness. We have a contrast here. It, it is assuming that we are presenting our bodies, and, and with that goes every part of our bodies. We are presenting our bodies ready for service. So will that service be as a weapon to do evil or as a, love this language, a weapon to do what God says is right? And uh, that is a stark contrast. Uh, what are you going to use your eyes for? Are you going to use your eyes to look at creation and marvel at God's gifts? Or are you going to look at your eyes to think about what you're going to steal or to lust after something? Are you going to use your hands for good and honest, God-pleasing work in your vocation? Or are you going to use your hands to do all kinds of wickedness and nastiness? God is saying you are to present yourselves and the parts of your body for service. What kind of service is it going to be? Mm. I, I appreciate what you said, because I think it, it comes out again later in the text, too, that one way or the other, you're going to be doing this. Uh, we have this false idea that we can just, you know, we're somehow free from these things, that we're not presenting ourselves. Well, I'm, I'm sort of neutral in this. And, and Paul would say, no, you're either going to present your body to sin for slavery to it, and that's going to be unrighteousness, or you're going to present yourself to God and, and give your members to him for serving 
in righteousness and that military language that that makes it very very stark that that this is a it's not a it's not a small matter i mean war warfare fighting battles these these are not small things these are matters of significance and so what i do even with my eyes or even with my hands this is a big deal and and, and i shouldn't i shouldn't take it lightly I, I think we often do just sort of, you know, how, how often do we go about our daily lives just doing the things we do because that's what we do. That, that's what there is to do. And so I'm going I'm to do it without really thinking about, you know, am I using my eyes for, for God's service? Am I using my hands, my feet, the various parts of my body, my mind, for my tongue, for the service of God? Or am I, am I using those things to, to fight on the side of, of sin? That, that's a that's a very very stark reminder and, and I don't want to miss what's in the middle though in in verse 13 the second part where he says present yourselves to God notice how he, he grounds this in the promise you present yourself to God because you are those who have been brought from death to life he, he's grounding this still in what God has done for his people in holy baptism this this ability to do what God has said, to present our members to him for his service for righteousness. This is a gift from him because he has brought us from death to life in his son, Christ Jesus. We have, uh, we have lots of gift talk, and it is very, very clear. Paul has laid out the argument in the previous five and a half chapters that we are not justified by what we do or by works of the law. And now he's shifting focus and saying that does not mean that the works of the law, the moral law, are unimportant in the life of a Christian. There's lots of repetition here because the old Adam is strong and we are slow learners. And he needs to teach and teach and teach and teach this training in righteousness, that, that Roman uh, soldier imagery here. How does a Roman soldier get good at throwing a spear? or using his sword, or uh, knowing when and how to use his shield. Practice, practice, practice. He practiced, that Roman soldier practiced, so that he was in absolute, complete command of the weapons that were at his disposal. And what are the weapons that are at our disposal here? Well, it's the members of our body, our eyes, our ears, our hands, our feet, our tongue, and God is teaching us here that we are to train like a Roman soldier, not the way the world would have us train, not the way our sinful flesh would have us train, but the way the gracious and merciful God who loves us and has saved us has taught us what is good, what is meat, what is right, what is salutary. Mm, yeah, the, I was, as you were talking there, Paul's going to build on this thought throughout the letter to the Romans. As, as you said, chapter 7 is coming where he's going to describe the struggle. Chapter 8, there's no more condemnation. Chapters 9 through 11 are, are going to dig into that, that mystery of, of the matter of the people of Israel and, and why they have not all believed. But then when he, it's almost like he's going to come back to this again in chapter 12, where he talks about presenting, again, your bodies as a living sacrifice, which, I mean, that talking about this military imagery you, know, you think about about weapons typically you use the weapon to to kill but but paul says your bodies become living sacrifices later so what does that what does that weaponry look like well it's not the weapons of this world but it is the the weapon of, of sacrifice of i mean i think of the ten commandments of, of love for the neighbor not concern for myself but love for god and love for the neighbor it's a lot, lots to chew on there pastor poppy before we before we take our break, and feel free to respond to that if you want, but I'd like to look at, at verse 14 before the break, too. This matter of, again, he, he seems to be grounding it, I think, further in the promise here. Sin has no more dominion over you because you're not under the law, you're under grace. Take us into verse 14. Uh, yes, and, and uh, before we leave that comment you made on Romans 12, I think that's very key and very significant. Uh, when we think of a sacrifice— uh, whether it uh, uh, an a bull, a goat, a pigeon, a dove, it doesn't matter. When you think of a sacrifice, uh, one thing that every sacrifice has in common is it dies. It dies. Sheds blood, cooked to a crispy crunch, it dies. Romans 12 should catch our attention because it says, present yourself as a living 
sacrifice. That seems contrary to reason and contrary to logic. We come back here to Romans 6, we have already died with Christ in our baptism. We have died with Christ as Good Friday has been delivered to us. We are raised with Christ in his uh, in our baptism with his resurrection and now we are dead and alive and we present ourselves as living sacrifices and that beautifully transitions into der- verse 14 because we are dead and alive as we present ourselves as living sacrifices sin will have no more reign there's that king talk again because we are not under law but under grace we have a different state, uh, a different citizenship, a different realm that we live in. And this takes us back to Romans 5, verse 2, where, where God teaches us um, through Paul that we are in a state of grace. Sin no longer reigns over us. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on Worldwide KFO, looking at the second half of Romans chapter 6 this morning. We're going to take a short break, but we will be right back. Please stick around. Wednesday's Bible study on law and gospel analyzes a passage from Scripture emphasizing the benefits of believing Jesus Christ and your victory over sin, death, and the devil. We encourage listeners of Law & Gospel to join this Bible study at 9.30 a.m. Central Time each Wednesday. Listen to Law & Gospel weekday mornings beginning at 9.30 on KFUO. LCMS Disaster Response and Training provides guidance and counsel to congregations seeking to show mercy to their neighbors before, during, and after disasters. From congregation preparedness to equipping volunteers in our Lutheran Early Response Team training, we can help you engage your community, particularly those who are suffering in any way with the love of Christ. For more information, you can follow us on Facebook, keyword LCMS Disaster Response, or visit our website at lcms.org forward slash disaster. The idea that our creation is the result of a fluke, an accident, is ridiculous. 100,000 monkeys typing on 100,000 typewriters, even after a million years, would never produce the works of William Shakespeare. But they might produce several episodes of Wrestling with the Basics Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. On air or on demand. A click away 24 hours a day at KFUO.org. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. On this Wednesday, May 6th, we are looking at Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 23 with Pastor Clint Poppy. He serves at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. Pastor Poppy, prior to the break, we looked at verses 12 through 14. And as Paul continues in verse 15, he he speaks again very similarly to the way this chapter began. What then are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Why why does Paul feel the need to repeat this here? Well, um, he's going to he's going to go on a little bit later and he's uh going to talk about uh you know I'm speaking to you in human terms. I think that comes up in verse uh 19. I'm speaking to you in human terms and there's been, you know, some debate what that means. I think it's really simple. Uh humans are slow to learn and we need repetition. And that's exactly what Paul is doing here. We we uh, started out Romans 6 in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? And now here in verse 15, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. He's asking the same rhetorical question with just a little bit different nuance because sin, sick Christians, that's all of us, we who battle that old Adam that lives in us every day, we need that constant teaching, that constant reminder. We need that constant death where we die to sin every day. 
and then come forth as a new creation, ready to love God and serve our neighbor. It uh, really connects us to baptism part four in Luther's small catechism. What does such baptizing with water indicate? It indicates that we need to die daily. And I don't know about you, Tim, but I don't want to die. I want to live. My passions don't want to die. They want to live. And so this has to be a free, willing, conscious effort to die to sin and rise with Christ. I can't do it on my own. Thanks be to God. He's there with me. Right. And, and that's, I mean, Paul's going to get into that as the, as the text moves on. A couple of, of thoughts there. The matter of repetition. Yeah, we, we need it as people. We need to, I mean, and, and when, God, when God takes the time to repeat something in his word, it's probably worth our time to pay attention. And, and how, how often Amen. does he do that? You know, I mean, so, so often he repeats things. So that means it's important. So keep listening further. I mean, the matter of, of this in particular in the letter of Romans would have likely been read orally within a congregation in that Roman congregation and others, the letter might've gone to as well. And so, you know, think about how do you hear, you need to hear things repeated when you're reading something, you can, you can go back and look at it, but when you're hearing, you, you don't always get to go back. So the, the matter of repetition is, is important. Uh, another another thing that that I um, I was reading in uh, Martin Franzman's commentary in the Book of Romans from CPH this morning, and and he points out that the first time in this chapter where where Paul does this, what shall we say? Then should we keep on sinning? He he grounds the reality of his answer no way in the in holy baptism, as you pointed out with. Uh, what Luther does with it in the fourth part in his catechism here, what he, what he's going to do is he's going to take us into in verse, uh, where is it? It's verse 17, the verse, the end of verse 17, he's going to ground it in the matter of doctrine in the matter of, of the teaching of Christ. And, and think about what Christ did for his apostles when he, when he sent them out at the end of Matthew's gospel, he, he gave them baptism and his teaching as, as that which will continue to make disciples in this world. And here Paul is, is expounding upon that very teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ within the letter to the Romans. I thought that was a really great insight on his part. So Paul, Paul then says, you know, hey, no way again, right? This is, this is as strong as he can say no to this question. And, and now he's going to, to shift images a little bit here. And we've, we've already touched on this some. The, the primary image, it seems, in verses 12 through 14 is this matter of who's your king, who's your Lord, and, and how are you serving as a soldier for him? Now the, the image shifts a bit to who, is, and it, although it's not, it's, it's related, but who is, your, who is your master? Who are you serving as a slave? And, and this is where, as we alluded to at the very beginning, things may get a bit uncomfortable to, for us and, and perhaps a bit shocking because we don't usually think of ourselves as slaves. You know, I mean, First Amendment, right? The, the freedom of an, on several amendments within the Bill of Rights. It's all, all about our freedom. We don't often think of ourselves as slaves. But as, as Paul continues here in verse 16, he, he basically says, look, you're going to be a slave to someone it's just a matter of who's your master start start taking us into paul's argument beginning in verse 16. yeah verse 16 uh, gives us a little bit of a ship and if you a shift if you want to think of uh, a stair step kind of an argument he's repeating himself he's uh, going over many of the same things that he's uh, already said he's going to say them again but he's uh as he did in uh at the end of romans chapter five every time he's repeating something it's a, a little bit new a nuanced a little bit added thing here and what begins in verse 16 is he's going to start talking about the result you have two options you can either be a slave to sin or you can be a slave to god and there are results if you are a slave to sin it's going to result in one thing if you are a slave to the one true god who loved you and set you free in jesus christ there's going to be a different kind of a result do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves you are slaves of the one whom you obey either of sin which leads to death and we're not talking about temporal death here everybody's going to die temporally we're talking about eternal death here or of obedience which leads to righteousness and that obedience word is a key word because it is focusing not only 
on the obedience of a Christian to the Word of God, but it's focusing primarily on the obedience of Christ, Christ who was obedient to the will of the Father, Christ who went to the cross and fulfilled the law for us, now the law is no longer something that I have to try to do to achieve salvation. That's already be accomplished. Now I can freely, as if like a slave, present myself to God, and I freely and willingly become an obedient slave, which leads not only in holiness, but ultimately to eternal life. I, I I like I like the connection you made there with the word obedience to the obedience of Christ first and foremost that that He is the one who was obedient unto death for us sinners, and and I always like to point out too, and I've I've done this here on Sharp Iron before with other guests, that that in Greek this word that's often translated obedience is is wider than that. It's it's related the the Greek word is is hupakuo, which which mean literally means put yourself under the hearing of something. And and so obedience is, is certainly a part of that, that you would be under the hearing of God's Word because God's Word has commands. And to be under the hearing of a command means to, to obey it, to do it. But so much of God's Word is not only commands. There is also lots of, of gospel. <laughs> There's lots of promises. And to be under the hearing of of a promise is not to do a promise, but it is, as Paul has laid out very beautifully, particularly in chapter four, to be under a promise is, is not to do it, but to believe it, to, to trust that it is true. And, and so, I mean, this, this word obedience, I think in, in English is just a bit too uh, narrow for, for us. And we need a, we need a wider understanding of it. Lest, lest we, as you pointed out, I think earlier, you know, fall into some sort of works righteousness here as if God has given me my spot under his reign, and now I have to keep it by by what I do, and that's that's not Paul's point, you know. I mean, and that's where where verse seventeen starts to come in, I think, because as you've said, this this becomes a matter of of willingness on the part of the Christian, right? Paul's going to talk about this has happened. You've become obedient from the heart. This is this is something that's actually changed, and your God actually changes your will so that you do begin to start to want to do the things that God has given you to do. But but notice it's still all his work, right? You you were committed to these things. You you this is something that God has done passively to you. Take take us into verse seventeen, Pastor Poppy. I, I think that from the heart language is uh, is a great stepping stone. You know, we've talked already here that you know you live in America, you're free. You don't want to think about having a king. You don't want to think about. Um, uh, any slavery kind of issues, but I think Americans can uh, can relate to this as a matter of patriotism. Why would someone be willing to lay down their life for their country when they don't have to? When someone is living in a free country and you can pretty much do whatever you want to, why would someone freely and willingly obey the laws of the city, the state, the federal government? There, there are people, because they love their country so much, they will obey, they will serve, they will even lay down the ultimate sacrifice for that idea, for that ideal. I think in a similar way, we can think about this as Christians. We, who are now slaves to the one true God, we know what it's like. We were slaves to sin, and now God has set us free. It's like being in an oppressive country and then somehow all of a sudden finding yourself as a citizen of the United States where you have this, this uh, freedom. And so now this isn't a matter of God has to give us a law so that we want to love him or follow him. God has changed our heart. God has given us a new attitude, and now he wants those new attitudes to overflow into acts of service, uh, doing what God says is right, not because we have to, but because our heart has been changed and we want to. Mm, right, yeah. I mean, this is this is where, in, to go back to what you're saying at the very beginning, this is, you know, God, God has given us a new life, and he... He expects it to come forth because because this is what he's given to us. That and you know, to go back to baptism again, 
this is that which God is working out in us in baptism. All of those, all of those fruits of holy baptism that get laid out, particularly in the second part of baptism. You know what? What is the benefit of it? And on that that freedom from sin, death, and the devil, now is is worked out in the fourth part, where where daily, as you said, the old Adam is is put to death, and the new man emerges in the resurrection of Christ to live in that righteousness and purity before God forever. And and that's what what Paul is, is saying here that that look, you you once were slaves of sin, but now God has changed your heart. He's given you a new heart. Uh, Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel uses this imagery often. And then I think when, when Jesus in the, in the Sermon on the Mount and, and elsewhere talks about the matter of plucking out eyes or cutting off limbs, ultimately he knows that what has to happen is, is it's got to be a, a new heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And, and Paul says that's what you've been given. That's what you were committed to. It happened here in the standard of teaching, the doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ, that which which he commands his apostles to treasure, to keep, to hold on to there at the end of, of Matthew's gospel. And, and that means now that you are set free from sin, you're slaves of righteousness. I mean, that, and again, that, we, we may need to dwell on that a little bit longer, Pastor Poppy, this, because it's, it's very striking, I think. What, how is it that well, we're and, slaves of righteousness? Go ahead. Key... There's a key word in, uh, in the ESV translation that can be kind of lost. And again, this is why your, your pastors uh, go to the seminary and learn Greek and all that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, in verse 17, it says, uh, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you are committed. Now, that word that is translated standard in the ESV is literally a mold. And, uh, I, you know, when, when I was a kid, you know, I'm in my 60s. When I was a kid, I had creepy crawlers. Some of, uh, some of the older listeners will remember that. And you got a bottle of goop, and you put it in your mold, and you cooked it, and you had your little plastic lizard or whatever the heck it was. Um, this is the imagery that, you know, you said Franzman talked about the, the, the body or the corpus of the teaching. This is how God molds us and forms us and shapes us to be the kind of people that he would have us be. He is molding us by the power of his word. He is molding us with the doctrine, with the teaching. There's no unimportant part of God's word. And this is how he molds us and shapes us body, mind, uh, everything, molds us and shapes us so that we, from the heart, want to be slaves to God, following His Word, His holy will. And if you want to think of it this way, we don't always want to be in that mold. Sometimes God's got to uh, push us and shape us or prune us or uh, squeeze us into the mold because we're not a willing participant. But I think that mold imagery there is uh, is very helpful. At least it's helpful for me anyway. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's always good to to put a picture to some of these things. the The image of a of a mold, I think, is is very helpful. It reminds me also of the of the language. I think it's in in Jeremiah and probably elsewhere of the of the potter shaping the clay. Um, that's that's you know this is what what Christ is doing through his through his word, and and Paul says in verse nineteen he's speaking here in human terms and you, you addressed that a little bit earlier Pastor Poppy that that you know in human terms we need this repetition we need to be spoken to one, over and over again the Lord needs to re to repeat this to to get it into our our stubborn hearts that old Adam doesn't like to hear these things so he needs to hear them over and over and over again I also I also think the matter of, of human terms too um, the 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 image of slavery is very strong. And and in human terms, perhaps could convey the wrong thing in in some respects, and we've we've alluded to this already, that when we think of slavery, we often think of a, a harsh master, and I, Paul doesn't want to communicate that about God. God is not our master in the sense of what we often think of slavery. He's he's a different sort of ruler, and I think that's part of what's going on. In the, that human terms is, is Paul saying, don't don't take that too far. Remember that God is your your gracious King. Uh, what do you think? I, I think you're you're absolutely right. And I'm reminded when you were saying that I'm reminded of the uh, Old Testament readings in the season of Advent, where we we talk about uh, God as a King, 
and but he's not a king like the other kings because the other kings all they want to do is take their feet and smash their subjects uh, for their own personal gain our our king is a is a king that uh, loves us that cares for us and this is uh, this is a completely foreign concept to uh, to people who are used to the way things are done uh, on Isaiah 9 is what I was thinking about. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. This is not how a king normally operates justice and righteousness god is our king and we are his free and willing subjects we want to serve him i think another picture or imagery that may be helpful for our listeners is the uh, picture or imagery of um, wives submitting to their husbands and husbands sacrificing to for their wives uh... this is this is a free and willing sacrifice and submission, not forced. I suppose you could think that a wife, a wife submitting to her husband is a form of slavery, but it's just the opposite. It is in joyous response to the sacrificial love of her husband. And I think, I think we can bring both of those pictures in here, especially since Paul does in Ephesians chapter 5. Definitely, and and I mean with that, with that, go back to, to go back to that kingdom language, the reign language. Think about how how Jesus reigned as king. I mean, we just got done with Matthew's gospel a few weeks ago here on Sharper Iron, and and what's the sign over Jesus? This is the King of the Jews there on the cross, and that that truly is where he reigns as our King, bringing forgiveness and life. I, I think of of the way Luther phrased it in the Catechism in the second article. What what has Christ done for me that that he he paid that price with his holy precious blood his innocent suffering death that and, and why that I might be his own and live under him in his kingdom this is this is not a harsh master but a gracious king who rules perfectly I mean where where David and I mean even David the the king par excellence in the Old Testament didn't get it right all the time. He did not always reign for the good of his subjects. He often reigned with his own selfish motives in mind. And, and the example in, in 2 Samuel with, with Bathsheba and Uriah comes to mind right away. But, but not our Lord Jesus Christ. His reign is always for the good of his subjects, always for, for our good. That's, and, and that's where you know the, the human terms, the natural limitations comes into play when it comes to this matter of slavery. The slavery that we have under under God to His righteousness is is a it's 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 like a like you said a, a wife toward her husband or a son toward his father that that in both of those cases it's it's coming from a willing heart because you know the sacrifices that are being made for you for your good already I, I want to we've got five minutes left Pastor Bobby I want to make sure we get toward the end of this this text because there's, we there's so much three more. hours instead of one I this know text, it but... that always happens <laughs> it always happens so uh, oh man I don't know where you you pick what's most important I think I think probably what is most important is is to dwell a little bit on on what we were just talking about in verses 20 through through 22 Paul says he compares slavery to sin freedom to righteousness you know, slavery, sin sometimes seems like freedom to us, but it's really slavery. And and slavery to God, well, I mean, this matter of being under God might seem slavery, but that's true freedom. I, I think that's that's pretty important to, to dwell on before, and then I think we can finish with verse 23. Yeah, I think uh, uh, when we are slaves to sin, it gives us uh, an illusion of freedom. Because, let's be honest, there is a certain kind of freedom when you don't have any rules to follow. You know, join the resistance, do whatever you want to, live in an open marriage. Uh, there is a certain kind of freedom that is there, at least on the surface. But if you think about it, and this is what Paul, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is encouraging the hearers to do, think about it. Were you really free no, you weren't. You had a different kind of slavery. And now when you think about 
who you were and what you did, all that is is shame. That 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 uh, freedom that you thought was freedom was a fake freedom. It wasn't a happy freedom. It led to nothing but shame, and ultimately this shame leads to eternal death. The fruit, and that's where we get into uh, verse 21, where we start talking about the fruit. The fruit of being a slave to sin is eternal death. The fruit of being a slave to God, now you would think that it would be eternal life, but then that would mean works righteousness. So uh, Paul cannot contradict himself because the Lord can't contradict himself. The fruit of being a slave to God is doing what God says is right, leading a holy life. And at the end of leading a holy life, not because we were holy, but because God has set us free by the blood of Jesus, the ultimate result is eternal life. He's very, very clear to talk about the result of a fake freedom and a happy, joyous freedom in Jesus Christ, exhorting us and encouraging us to be uh, the kind of holy people God would have us be, and not giving the impression that we are saved by our good works. So then with just under three minutes here, Pastor Bobby, take us into that final verse. Wrap things up for us. The wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We know this. Give us the goods. The uh, the good news here, um, again, many confirmation verses. This is uh, probably the most, if you want to, if somebody asks you, hey, as a Lutheran, I hear you're about law and gospel. This what might be a passage because it's as simple uh, as you can possibly get. Again, this is the, uh, the, uh, the metaphor or the example of military soldiers. Uh, a soldier does his work, he earns his wages, uh, he gets paid. The wages, just like a, a military soldier's wage, the payment for being a slave to sin is death. And again, this is not just temporal death, this is eternal separation from God in hell. In contrast, the free gift, purely by grace, not what we earn or deserve, not by paying, praying, or obeying. Uh, some have equated this to like a military bonus that a military soldier got, uh, not because of work, but just because of the graciousness of the governor or the leader. The free gift of God is eternal life, and I think it's important that uh, Paul emphasizes Christ Jesus our Lord, Christ anointed, Jesus Savior, Rescuer, and Lord, who is our Master or Lord of Life. All three of these three things give us a beautiful, full picture of who Christ is to be for us as Christians. Pastor Clint Poppy is the pastor at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Lincoln, Nebraska, helping us this morning with Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. Pastor Poppy, thanks for being with us today. That's always a great joy. Thanks for having me. Sin is not your master. Christ, and he is not a harsh tyrant, but he is a gracious Lord, the King who ruled for you by giving up his own life on the cross picking it up again on the third day to make you his own, to bring you under his gracious reign, where he does everything for your good, where he bestows upon you freely his gifts of life, forgiveness, and salvation, those gifts that manifest themselves within your own mortal body, in, and you are presenting yourself as a, a, an instrument for God's use, for his righteousness. Sin is not your master anymore. Your Lord Jesus Christ is, and he is a gracious one who gives you freely the gift of eternal life. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.